Hi, and welcome to AP Chemistry Review. It's me, Dr. V, and we're here today to get ready for the AP Chemistry exam in May. In this webcast, we're going to look at free response question number two from the 2018 release exam. So, before we begin, all right, this is one of the long free response questions from the 2018 exam. It was scored out of 10 points. And characteristic for the AP Chemistry exam, these long free response questions cover multiple topics, multiple units, multiple skill sets. So you've got to be ready to jump from one topic to another. I, I strongly recommend that you work through the problem on your own before you listen to me go through the solution. All right, so you'll need your calculator, you want your periodic table, you want your formula sheet, and try to do each problem uh, before I go through it. If you want to do each part by part, that's fine. Or if you want to sit down and just work through all the parts of the question, because there are many of them, that's a good idea. But that's what's going to be most beneficial to you. All right, and then you can keep track of your score. How many points would you have earned if this had actually been a test setting? Right, because that's a good judge for you and how you're doing in terms of progress. Things to keep in mind with these questions, it's not about memorizing um, just certain things. You need to be able to apply that information in a variety of contexts. So it's not as though, oh, if I memorize all the things for this question, I'm set to go. Um, this year's test is going to ask for these skills to be demonstrated in different ways. So the more you practice, the better prepared you'll be. That's just my spiel. All right, so let's look at this question, which is quite long. Um, we're looking at the reactions of um, nitrogen oxides, and one of the reactions requires an equimolar mixture of NO and NO2, and the student is going to make this using the reaction represented above. So 2NO plus O2 to make 2NO2. All right, we're going to do a particle level representation, all right, um, where we're going to represent oxygen atoms with open circles and nitrogen atoms with gray circles that are filled in. And what the question gives us is the products. Here, here are the particles and the products. What would the reactants be? This slide got really, really busy. So I actually put that on the next slide. All right, so here we go. Here's the product mixture, all right, um, and the balanced equation, all right. So if these are the products that we get, what do the reactants need to be, given that the only elements are nitrogen and oxygen? So the approach you need to take here is to count, right? Count your atoms. If we look at the box for the product mixture, there are eight nitrogen atoms, right? Eight gray circles. And there are 12 oxygen atoms. So that means when we go to work on our reactants, we need to make sure there are eight nitrogens and 12 oxygens. Uh, this question was scored out of two points. One of the things that you had to do in order to get uh, a point was to make sure that you had the right number of each kind of atom present in the reactant box, so eight N's and 12 O's. But we also want you to be able to demonstrate what the molecules look like. So we have eight nitrogen atoms. The nitrogens on the reactant side are nitrogen monoxide and O molecules. Uh, since I have eight N atoms, I can have eight NO molecules, and I need to draw those. When I draw my eight NO molecules, that uses eight out of my 12 oxygen atoms, right? Of course. And that means I can make two oxygen molecules, two O2 molecules. And that's what we're looking for to get the second point. So that's really what you need to have in your reactant box. All right. So it's really counting and then representing molecules on a particle level. All right. So really a pretty easy two points, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, okay. The student reads in a reference text that NO and NO2 will react um, according to the reaction shown here. And then we're given, uh, given some thermodynamic data. So we're given delta H, we're given delta S, we're given delta G for this reaction. So now we're on part B. The student begins with an equimolar mixture of NO and NO2 in a rigid reaction vessel, and the mixture reaches equilibrium at 298 Kelvin. All right, so we have a temperature. Um, we're in a rigid reaction vessel. Oh, what does it actually want us to do? Calculate the value of the equilibrium constant K for this reaction at 298 Kelvin. So at this point, if you don't remember the relationship between delta G and K, it's on your formula sheet. You can go grab it from there, right? This question was scored out of one point, by the way. 
So it's pretty much all or nothing. Either you have the correct answer with supporting work, or if you make a small mistake, you may or may not get the, the point, depending on what happened. So the equation sheet gives us the formula delta G equals negative RT ln of K. R is the universal gas constant. We need to use the, ver the version that has joules per mole per Kelvin as the unit. T is the temperature in Kelvin, which we were given, how convenient, and ln of K. And we know delta G. So we can use this, but I actually find it easier if I recast this equation so I'm solving for K more directly. It's all good in the end. All right, so I like to rewrite it as K equals E to the negative delta G over RT. I just find it easier to work this way. Um, but what's important is that you show appropriate work to support your answer in the end, and not that you do it exactly the same way I did it here. I do want to point out that it's very important with solving these problems that you pay attention to your units. Delta G that we were given was in kilojoules per mole. But the R, the universal gas constant that we're using from the periodic, from our formula sheet, has units of joules per mole per Kelvin. Kilojoules and joules aren't interchangeable, right? We can convert between them, but the math won't work unless we do that. So we have to pay attention. So we can go ahead and substitute that in. I chose to take my delta G in kilojoules and convert it to joules, right? I was given the temperature in Kelvin, so I don't even have to do that conversion. And then I'm going to substitute in the value from R uh, right from the formula sheet. So I can just do this, this evaluation, get an answer, and I get an equilibrium constant of 0 0.70. Now let's think about this in terms of making sure that our answer makes sense, because it is correct, and I've got all the supporting work. This is more than sufficient. Delta G is a positive number, and that means K should be less than 1. So that's all very consistent. I also left two sig figs in my value for k because delta g was reported with two significant figures. Not that this question was graded on sig figs, but you never know. You should try to pay attention to that. All right, so part two of part b asks, if both NO and NO2 start with initial partial pressures of one atmosphere, will the partial pressure of N2O3 at equilibrium be equal to one atmosphere? Yes or no? All right, so this was scored out of one point. Questions like this, right, you A, have to answer the question correctly. Will it be equal to one, yes or no? And give math-based reasoning as to why that is. Um, and if your answer isn't correct in both parts, you don't get the point. So the answer is no. The partial pressure of N2O3 at equilibrium will not be equal to one. There's actually two ways you could have chosen to answer this, all right? One way is thinking about our equilibrium constant from part one of this section, right? That KEQ is less than one, which tells us that at equilibrium, the equilibrium position favors reactants. We're going to have a substantial amount of reactants at equilibrium, right? And so we're still going to have NO and NO2 once equilibrium is established, which means the partial pressure of the product can't be one atmosphere, right? Um, Alternatively, in order to get the partial pressure of N2O3 to equal 1, right, I have to use up all of my NO and all of my NO2 because everything's in a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, which means the reaction's going to completion, which is not at equilibrium, which means I wouldn't have any reactants left. So that is contradictory to the KEQ that we calculated. So you needed to have language along those lines in order to get the point here. Just saying it was no wasn't enough. You had to back it up appropriately. All right, the student then goes on to hypothesize that increasing the temperature will increase the amount of N2O3 in the equilibrium mixture. Do you agree or disagree with the hypothesis? Justify your answer. Okay, so this is where looking at the thermodynamic data, the rest of the thermodynamic data can be really helpful. And what I really wanted to point out was delta H. Notice that delta H is a negative number, and that means that the uh, reaction is exothermic, right? The energy, we can think of it as a product, all right? So I disagree with this statement. The reaction is exothermic, which means if I increase the temperature, all right, the rate of the reverse reaction is going to speed up preferentially. Um, and the equilibrium position the, is going to proceed and make more reactants. Um, so I'm going to proceed in the reverse direction to reestablish equilibrium or to get to equilibrium. And the reactants do not contain N2O3. That's my product. And so um, that 
isn't what we would see. We would not see an increase in the amount of N2O3. So again, this was a one point question. You had to disagree and give an appropriate justification. Um, you don't have to write a lot here, but you do need to have enough, all right? Um, bullet points are great. They don't have to be complete sentences. If you're writing more than two or three bullet points, you're probably writing too much, all right? Because this is a time test and you have a lot to do in a very short time. All right, N2O3 reacts with water to form nitrous acid, which has the formula HNO2. Here's the equation. Um, okay, the skeletal structure of the HNO2 molecule is shown below. Complete the Lewis dot diagram, all right, including all lone pairs. Hopefully this is a skill you're very comfortable with. Uh, it was scored out of one point. Uh, it needs to be an acceptable Lewis structure, so it needs to follow all the rules, all right? So the first thing you need to do is count the valence electrons in the molecule. Each oxygen contributes six valence electrons. The nitrogen contributes five. The hydrogen contributes one. So that's a total of 18 electrons in the structure. So you need to make sure all 18 electrons are accounted for. And then you also want to make sure that nitrogen and oxygen obey the octet rule when you're done with your structure. Uh, hydrogen will be content with two electrons. All right. And you do need to make sure all your valence electrons are shown. So if you have lone pair electrons, which you will, that they end up in appropriate places. All right. So the structure I drew is here. So I have a single bond between the hydrogen and the left hand oxygen. The left hand oxygen has two lone pairs and is also single bonded to the nitrogen. The nitrogen is double bonded to the right hand oxygen, which has two lone pairs. And then the nitrogen itself has a lone pair as well. So I've got all 18 electrons accounted for and octets for all the atoms. So that is a good thing. All right. Um, the question did not ask you about optimal structures and formal charges. Um, so this actually is the preferred structure, but there are other structures that would be accepted for credit. Um, I just like this one a lot. All right. So the next part asks you to work with the structure you drew. So your answer for part two here needs to be consistent with the Lewis structure. So I just literally copied and pasted it here. Identify the hybridization of the nitrogen atom in the HNO2 molecule. Uh, and again, this was scored out of one point. It's pretty much all or nothing. Either your answer is consistent with your structure or it's not. And the answer is sp2. That's actually all you have to write. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to say how you got there. You just need to write sp2. How do we know it's sp2? There are three electron domains around the nitrogen in this structure, right? The nitrogen is bonded to two atoms and it's got a lone pair. So three electron domains, that would be an sp2 hybridization. End of story. All right, and now we're gonna shift gears again. Um, to make an aqueous solution of HNO2, the student reacts N2O3 with water. Um, we're making a whole bunch of HNO2 in here. And then we're going to titrate that solution with 0.100 molar KOH. Here's the neutralization reaction. Okay. So what I want to point out here is that all the coefficients in this neutralization reaction are one to one, right? Everything's in a one to one ratio, which means if there's stoichiometry, that's going to be super easy because moles of one will give us moles of the other. Oh, let's go on and see what we've got. A the following titration curve shows the change in pH of the solution during the titration. Use the titration curve and the information we've already been given to find the initial concentration of the HNO2 solution. Oh, I told you there'd be some stoichiometry. Here it is. So, all right, this was also scored out of one point. Um, we knew that we had a 100 milliliter sample of the acid originally. It was, we were told, 100.0 milliliters, all right? Um, and the equivalence point uh, is reached when we've added 20 mils of the 0 0.100 molar KOH. All right, so we know the molarity and the volume of the KOH that we use to reach the equivalence point, which will exactly neutralize all of the acid present in that original 100 mils sample. All right, um, and so the moles of acid that were present in that original HNO2 sample uh, equals the moles of KOH, the base that we have to add here. And there, everything's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that means we can use really the molarity formula to do our stoichiometry, right? The molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid will equal the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. And that will make the moles in that one-to-one -one ratio that we want. So we know everything except for the molarity of the acid. So I can actually rearrange my equation and substitute 
in the molarity of the base, the volume of the base, um, divide that by the volume of the acid, right? And I get an answer of 0 0.0200 molar for the uh, initial acid concentration. All right, so if you got that and you supported it with appropriate work, you're good to go and you earn that point. Now the titration curve also asks, um, goes on and asks us estimate the value of the pKa for HNO2. This also was one point. Again, pretty much all or nothing. Um, so in order to answer this question, you need to recall that at the half equivalence point, the pH will equal the pKa of that weak acid. So we know the equivalence point was at 20 mils. So the half equivalence point is at 10 mils of KOH. And so we just need to read over on the graph and find the pH um, of the solution when 10 mils of KOH had been added. And it's about 3.4. Um, it's a little above 3. It's just shy of the halfway mark. 3.4 seems like a reasonable number. If you wrote it down as 3.5, that's just fine. Um, and so the pKa of the, of the acid is 3.4, and that's literally all you had to write down. You didn't have to write down how you got it. You just had to write down pKa equals 3.4, and you're done. Okay. And finally, one last part. During the titration, after a volume of 15 mils of 0.1 molar KOH has been added, which species is present at a higher concentration, HNO2, the, eight, the weak acid, or NO2 minus its conjugate base? Justify your answer. Okay, so we were just talking about the half equivalence point. We know at the half equivalence point that the weak acid, uh, the pH equals the pKa. Um, and that also means that the weak acid concentration equals the conjugate base concentration. That's uh, has to be true in order for the pH to equal the pKa. And again, this question was scored out of one point. All right, so at 15 mils, we are past the half equivalence point. We already know that was at 10 mils. We're beyond that. So I've used up more than half of my HA and converted it into its conjugate base. All right, and so the answer to part F is that the nitrite ion, NO2 minus, is present in the higher concentration because we're past the half equivalence point in the titration. All right, so you had to say NO2 minus, and that we're past the half equivalence point to get the point for this problem. All right, at this point, add up your scores. How did you do? All right, in 2018, when this question was, one of the questions on the exam, the average score was 4.07 points out of 10. So if you got four points, you're doing fine. Uh, you're at or above the national average. If you got six or eight or all 10 points, then you are doing very well and you should be very, very pleased with yourself. Um, we will continue working through these. Come check in anytime. That's the beauty of YouTube. And if you haven't already, um, you know, followed me on YouTube, then please make sure you do that.